Hello, and welcome to the Johnson Controls Blue Water Webinar for May. Each monthly webinar is an interactive digital experience for water utilities to learn more about new technologies, software, services, and best practices in a vendor neutral format. The Blue Water Webinar is brought to you by the Water Infrastructure Technology Team of Johnson Controls. I am Craig Hanna, and I have the privilege of serving as the engineering manager of this wonderful team. I have been designing projects that reduce both real and apparent water loss, that increase staff efficiency, and that decrease operational and maintenance expenditures for water utilities for the past 20 years. And joining me today are two of my outstanding teammates, Ms. Audrey Noel and Mr. Jonathan Gunn. Audrey leads our team from sunny Southern California. And Audrey, would you please tell us more about yourself and how you serve the water industry? Absolutely, thanks, Craig. I'm Audrey Noel, Business Development Leader for the Water Infrastructure Technology Team here at Johnson Controls. I have about six years of industry experience with a background in environmental law and decades of experience in operations. And across this great nation, Jonathan Gunn leads our market. Jonathan? Yeah, thank you, Audrey. I'm Jonathan Gunn. I'm a market manager for our water infrastructure team, uh, engineer by trade, but uh, going to the other side for a little bit here at least. So I have uh, 12 years in the industry, and like Craig, I serve in a number of different capacities within the American Water Works Association, <clears throat> including as the current vice chair of the Customer Metering Practices Committee. And I also co-author a number of <laughs> manuals and publications. So um, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for those who have returned and for those that are new. Um, you know, something that we always do is uh, just kind of go over the screen that you see in front of you or that you should see um, and just make sure you're, you're comfortable with the console here. So as I'm going through these, you should see some orange dots pop up on your screen. Uh, obviously, the biggest window here is the slide deck. So this is where a majority of the action will happen. Uh, you'll see the slides as we progress through the webinar. Uh, any poll questions will show up here. You'll answer those as well. To the left of the slide deck here is the media player, where you're currently seeing my video feed, and you'll see the feed of our other presenters as we go through the webinar. This is also where you will see a video that we have queued up for you later in the webinar. And uh, this window is, is kind of small now, but it's, uh, it's supposed to get a lot bigger when that video plays. If for some reason it doesn't, this window and all the others are able to be moved around. They can be resized. You can really uh, make this experience your own. You don't have to go with the default that we have set up for you here. But um, just know that so, uh, you know, if it doesn't go full size, you, you can uh, make that bigger for the video. Below the media player is the related content section of the module. So here you'll find some files that are uh, downloadable that you can read at your leisure and serve as some supplemental material to the topics that we will discuss today. Beneath the slide deck, you have two boxes. Uh, one is the attendee chat, one is the ask a question. So the, uh, the attendee chat is very much as it sounds like it, it is there. Uh, that's something that's new just within the last month or two where you can actually chat with the fellow attendees on the call. So it doesn't have to just be us as the presenters, although if you want to do that, um, that is where the ask a question box comes in. Uh, certainly as we're going through the webinar, you don't have to wait to the Q&A uh, sessions, which we, we do have a couple of uh, built into the webinar here. Uh, you know, as we're going through the webinar, if you have a question, please submit that uh, and we'll have a queue going. And then when we get to those Q&A uh, stoppages, we will we'll go through those. If you feel that uh, the Q&A won't quite do it for you, uh, there are a couple more options as well. If you look to the right of the slide deck, uh, you have the email us and book a meeting function. So uh, you can send us an email and, and describe your problem or, or you know, what you want to talk about, I guess I should say, uh, in a little more detail there. Or if you feel that uh, a verbal conversation is something that you would prefer, we would always love to pick up the phone and chat with you and see how uh, we can help you and, and, and guide you in whatever goal it is you're looking to accomplish. So uh, last but not least, on the bottom here, you have the icon bar. And so uh, I mentioned earlier, you can move around these windows around, you can resize them. If in doing so, you accidentally happen to get rid of one of them, uh, fear not, you can go down to the icon bar and bring it right back. You see some familiar ones there, media player slides, ask a question, etc. You'll also see some icons for windows that are not currently up, such as the uh, earn CEU credit. So you are eligible to earn continuing education credits from this webinar. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, by all means, uh, you know, fill out that form and we'll get you a certificate as quickly as you can. There's also a reactions button there. So if you want to give us a, a thumbs up or, or otherwise, uh, as we're going through the webinar, uh, you know, please be sure to, to use that. And 
uh, let us know how we're doing in real time. And then uh, as far as after the webinar, we do ask uh, every month that uh, our attendees take a brief survey for us. And we're always looking to uh, improve this webinar series and really hit the topics that uh, are, are important to all of you that, that attend this webinar. So uh, there's an icon that for that as well. Uh, with all that being said, Craig, do you want to walk us through the agenda? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. We have a fun and hopefully very informative webinar for you today. Safety is always a primary concern for us, and we hope it is for you too. And we'll be starting our webinar, as we always do, with a safety talk. We've asked our old friend, Mr. Andy Crocker, from the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project to discuss water utility worker safety when looking for leaks. Among many other things, Andy teaches water utility staff the art and science of leak noise correlation and how to properly use a ground microphone to pinpoint a leak site. And as you know, we've been discussing water meter management for the past three webinars. And as much as we love talking about water meters, and trust me, we could do that all day, we are choosing to take a break from water meters and apparent water loss this month to focus upon real water loss reduction strategies. And one of the best ways of reducing the volume of water loss through leaks and breaks in the distribution distribution system is through the active use of an automated leak detection system. And we're going to have an interactive and in-depth discussion on that critical topic. And Jonathan's even going to show you what a million dollar leak looks like. And following that, our friends from Sheila Key, our friends Sheila Key, Mark Champagne, Mark Pisek and Phil Cole from ITRON will join us for an interactive discussion about both their proprietary automated leak detection system, along with water operations management, non-revenue water, and district metered areas. And so now I would like to introduce Mr. Andy Crocker from the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project or CERCAP. Andy is the Virginia State Manager for CERCAP, and he has been involved in teaching leak noise correlation and how to properly use a ground microphone to pinpoint a leak site to water utilities for many years. Andy, we are so glad to have you on the phone today. How long have you been uh, with CERCAP? I've been with CERCAP a little over 70 years, but I've been in the industry for just about 30. All right, all right. You must have started when you were a teenager then. Oh, yes, of course. I was about <laughs> nine, actually. So anyway, there you go. All well, right. Thank you for... I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we're so glad to have you today. And, and what are some of the things that you do for CERCAP? Well, CERCAP is a technical assistance provider, and um, many of the programs that allow, allow us to offer those services at no cost to small communities are, are through federal grants, from EPA, USDA, Rural Development, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. But we also have some state funds in Virginia that are allocated that allow us to award grants to small communities for water and wastewater projects. So we have, we have a lot of things that we can offer. And then aside of the shop on CERCAP, there's also a community action agency that um, we help with housing issues and other things. But I uh, primarily am on the other side where we do technical assistance. Okay. Well, Andy, as, as you well know, looking for leaks and breaks adds a lot of risk to the water utility worker because you're out there in the streets with traffic and all the other hazards that, that are out there. What would you like to tell us about being safe when looking for leaks and breaks? Well, Thanks for the opportunity, Craig, and I really appreciate it. Um, I recognize that we may be talking to folks from uh, different sized communities, um, different scenarios, some potentially more rural, many perhaps more urban, uh, and some somewhere in between. So there's some general rules that I'd like to share that at proven to be helpful for me over the years and my experience doing leak detection. So the first thing I'd like to, to make sure or to share is to, to make sure that you have a buddy or someone that you're out um, doing leak detection with. Now, I know I have and maybe some of you have had to go out by yourself in the middle of the night, and maybe when you're familiar enough with your surroundings and confident in them, 
uh, you feel comfortable doing that, but it's really not a good idea um, for a couple of reasons. Ob- obviously, um, if you were to get injured, somebody would be able to to either help you or get help for you. But there's a couple other things. If you're doing ground miking in particular, your attention is usually focused downward and you're not looking at your surroundings. So you may not be aware of something coming in the distance or other potential hazards that uh, you might be approaching or maybe approaching you. So if a buddy system is not available, I'd recommend arranging to have a cell phone or radio check on a regular basis. So when you go out into the field, make sure your cell phone is charged up. Um, next, know your surroundings and have a plan. Um, you need to have, make arrangements for traffic control depending upon your environment. I mean, if you're on an old country road, that may not be too big a deal. But if you're downtown somewhere, that is a big deal. Um, so make arrangements for traffic control. Um, make sure that you have the proper attire. You need, uh, at the very least, reflective clothing, reflective vest, um, so that you're easily seen by uh, oncoming vehicles. Um, you might also want to make sure that you have the proper kind of clothes from a, 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 a leggings or pants standpoint if you're wading through weeds and um, through fields and things like that. You might not be able to, to see some of the hazards like stickers, but snakes, things like that, uh, you definitely want to make sure you have protective clothing on that way. The last couple of things um, are maybe kind of common sense, but be aware of animals and all kinds of critters. Uh, very frequently, leak surveys involve going into valve boxes and meter boxes, and you can find some very unpleasant surprises down there. So make sure that you have flashlights if you're doing it at night and you can see clearly before you reach down into one of those boxes. Um, Maybe even carry some pepper spray. I'm a dog lover, and I'm hesitant to use pepper spray, but sometimes that protection is necessary. And where I live in the country, there even are coyotes that you run into um, from time to time. So make sure you're aware of your surroundings and be prepared for what you might face when you're out there. And those are just a few tips. We could spend a lot of time. I'm about leak detection kind of the way that uh, Craig and Johnson Controls are about meters. So uh, with that, I will kind of cut it here after just a few minutes. And, again, thank you for the opportunity, Craig, and um, I wish you continued success. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andy. That was a terrific, terrific uh, safety talk. Uh, I, I learned much from from that talk today. We really appreciate you taking time out to join the call. It's my pleasure. And uh, again, uh, keep up the great work. All right. Well, thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it yeah. over to Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andy. We, we definitely appreciate your time and your thoughts. Uh, as Craig said, just tremendous information there. And, and we really, really appreciate that. So thank you. <clears throat> So whenever we talk about leak detection, uh, one of the first questions that we're often asked is, does leak detection technology actually work? And to answer that question, we would like to share with you the results of a recent leak detection survey that we conducted last winter at a military base in Ontario, Canada. We used uh, correlating acoustic leak noise loggers to listen for leaks using fire hydrants and valves across the base. We found the usual assortment of leaking fire hydrants, leaks at isolation valves, which you would expect to find in just about any distribution system, and leaks on service lines to buildings, which included leaks on two service lines for buildings that had been demolished years ago. The graphs that you see on this slide, one is the noise frequency and the other is for the correlated distance between the loggers, serve as an example of what you may see when a leak is present. And as it turns out, this particular leak really got everyone's attention. And uh, take a minute, remember these uh, kind of bumps in the data and the spike over here. Just store those in your short-term memory for a minute. <clears throat> this particular leak required immediate excavation and repair due to the sheer magnitude of the leak. The photographs that you see on your screen are of the excavation of the leak site. 
and you can see from the image at the far right that the leak site was certainly not a dry hole. So sometimes that happens. This was not one of those cases. I'm just thankful that the break was pointed down into the ground and not upwards into the sky. Otherwise, it would have made for a very cold and even wetter experience for our fuel crew. When the excavation was completed and the pipe was fully exposed, we found a circumferential crack in the 8-inch iron pipe, as seen in the photograph to the left. The crack had an average width of approximately 1 8 inch and covered over half of the circumference of the pipe. Thankfully, this was repaired in fairly short order, and you can see the stainless steel repair clamp that was used in the photo to the right. So, we went out, we found, we repaired that leak. So now we're done, right? We can we can pick everything up, move to another part of the system, right? Well, it depends. <laughs> Out of an abundance of caution, it's best practice to perform a second correlation of that same pipe on the following day in order to confirm that no new leaks or breaks have formed in the area of the original leak site. If there are other weak spots in the pipe, sometimes the repair of a leak, especially one as large as this one, can inspire other leaks to try and pick up the slack, at least to some degree. This strategy also allows you to be more efficient with your equipment, because really, what's the point of going through the labor of picking up your correlators and redeploying them to another part of the system, just so you can come back to the original spot at a later time and find the same leaks that you could have found today. Thankfully, in this particular case, no new leaks were detected, and as you can see in the graphs on this slide, uh, there's no more peaks on there, and you can see where the red circles, there used to be some peaks there. If you're interested in reading about another example, you'll find a newspaper article in the related content section that I mentioned earlier in your console. And it's about one of our performance contracting projects in Pennsylvania that included an automated leak detection system. The utility had built a recreational area around what was believed to be a natural spring. No one had ever tested the water for chlorine, however, and the automated leak detection system quickly discovered that what was thought to be a natural spring was in reality a leak on a water main that was flowing up to 200,000 gallons of treated water per day. So getting back to the leak on the military base, um, if, you, if you look at the geometry of the leak, the size of the pipe, the average system pressure, uh, we calculated that the leak was flowing an estimated 215 gallons per minute. And for those who uh, really love math and doing, doing the extrapolations there, uh, that translates into 12,900 gallons per hour, just shy of 310,000 gallons per day. And over the course of one full year, that one site was wasting over 113 million gallons of treated water. Put another way, and Craig alluded to it earlier, this leak was costing the base a little more than $1 million per year if you look at the rates that they were paying. So... Why should you worry about leakage in your system? What if you don't have a million dollar leak? If your utility has a small staff uh, in particular that's already stretched thin, are the real benefits of having an automated leak detection system really worth the investment? And the simple answer is, yeah. By finding and fixing the leaks in your distribution system, you'll reduce both the volume and cost of non-revenue water in your system. You will also reduce the amount of energy that is required for pumping, and you will reduce the expenditures for chemicals that are used in the water treatment process. You will also prolong the life of your pumps, motors, and your wastewater treatment facility, or your water treatment facility, excuse me, since they won't need to process as much water in order to make up for the leaks. Lastly, you may either defer or even eliminate the need for new water sources, new or expanded water treatment facilities, and or additional ground storage just by reducing the leaks out in your system. There are other benefits as well. And if you, if you find and repair the leaks when they're still small, those leak sites cannot expand into a very expensive and catastrophic event like you see in this photo here. Automated leak detection systems can serve to reduce your property damage and liability claims by finding those leaks early and getting them repaired. As a brief aside, this photograph was given to us many years ago by a representative of an automated leak detection system technology provider. The photograph was taken in the very city in which this particular firm had their U.S. headquarters. Uh, one has to wonder if this blowout that you see here could have been prevented if the city had chosen to use that technology, which was literally right in their backyard. The fact that the blowout occurred next to the for sale sign on the property was uh, pretty ironic as well. Another benefit of leak detection is the reduced risk of back siphonage. Uh, many years ago, AWWA did a study 
on back siphonage from leak sites into the water distribution system. And the research showed that because sewer lines are often laid in proximity to water lines, there's a very real probability of contaminants such as fecal coliforms being back siphoned into the distribution systems. I took the photograph that you see in this slide at an apartment complex. The vault lid was missing and people were dumping their trash into the meter vault. We all know that leaks often occur near a water meter setting. And if there was a leak in this immediate area, the highly contaminated water could be back siphoned into the supply water that went to those apartments nearby without sufficient time for the residual chlorine or chloramines to kill any of the pathogens. I did want to, uh, to take a brief moment here as well and clarify some terminology specifically between automated leak detection systems and automated, or excuse me, acoustic leak noise surveys. Um, you know, today's webinar is focused upon automated leak detection systems. And by our definition, this means that a utility purchases their own leak detection equipment and then provides their own dedicated leak detection personnel to go into the field and find the leaks in the system. Acoustic leak noise surveys, on the other hand, utilize very similar, if, if not identical, <laughs> technologies, but instead of the utility buying the equipment and providing its own labor to find leaks in the system, the task is accomplished using a third party, basically like what we did for that military base in Ontario, Canada. Smaller water use uh, utilities simply may not have the resources needed to operate and maintain an automated leak detection system on their own. And thus a survey may be more beneficial and cost effective. Moreover, there are some areas in most every distribution system, large or small, in which an automated leak detection system may only be marginally effective and an acoustic leak noise survey in those areas is actually the better solution. In no way are we implying that one is necessarily better than the other. They are both tools in a toolkit and it depends on how a utility is operated, what their capacities are, and what makes the most sense ultimately. We'll take a deeper dive into acoustic leak noise surveys and other technologies in our webinar next month. So how do automated leak detection systems work? Well, regardless of the technology used or the manufacturer, all automated leak detection systems have the same fundamental operating principles. It's about energy transfer. Maybe not this much energy here as a lightning bolt, but, um, but energy nonetheless. <laughs> water distribution systems are pressurized, right? So there's energy. Whenever you pump water, you transfer energy from the motor to the pump and ultimately into the fluid. If there's an operating, or excuse me, if there's an opening or orifice in the pipe, you've introduced another transference of that energy. Some of that energy becomes an audible noise due to turbulence as the internal and external pressures seek to, to reach equilibrium. Some of the energy becomes a pressure wave that erodes much of the backfill that is supporting the pipe and sometimes even carves out a cavern around the pipe. And lastly, some of the energy becomes a mechanical vibration that radiates up and down the pipe from the leak site. Leak noise loggers are attached to nodes on the distribution system and they record those vibration frequencies. The vibration frequency history is stored in the internal memory of the noise logger and the data is then collected and analyzed using software to ascertain where that leak may be located. The method of collection varies by system, but it can include everything from uh, data transfer via a physical cable between a logger and a computer. It could be a radio frequency signal from the logger through either a mobile AMR or fixed-based AMI system, or it could be a cellular signal using LTEM or NB-IoT communication backhauls. A steam whistle uh, really makes for a useful analogy when we're trying to better understand the factors that affect vibrations from a leak site that are radiating along the pipe. In order to work, a steam whistle needs high pressure, a small orifice or opening, and a clean pipe that is made of metal and has a relatively small diameter. Keeping the image of the steam whistle in mind, the best conditions for an automated leak detection system include high distribution system pressure, hard backfill, a small orifice, relatively clean pipes, and preferably metal pipes. Automated leak detection systems are only effective on pipes that are about 12 inches in diameter or smaller. When you get to pipes that are 14 inches and larger in diameter, the increased wall thickness uh, really starts to dampen those vibrations uh, uh, pretty quickly, and different technologies must be used to find those leaks. Lined pipes will also quickly dampen any vibrations. 
So here's, uh, you know, these are some common materials that you'll find in today's water distribution systems. And as we mentioned a moment ago, an aut automated leak detection system will perform better with metallic pipes due to the increased hardness of the material. As you continue down the scale and the pipes materials become softer, leaks become more and more challenging to detect since the vibrations are simply not able to travel as far uh, before they're dampened. Oh, and while we're on the subject of non-metallic pipe, uh, please, please, please do yourself a huge favor if you're using any non-metallic pipe and lay some tracer wire alongside that non-metallic pipe while you're installing it. This small step will be greatly appreciated in the future if those pipes need to be relocated for any reason. Aside from pipe material, there are three types of leaks that are really challenging uh, for an automated leak detection system to find because they also quickly dampen any vibrations that result from a leak. The first type is called a blowout, and it constitutes a brittle failure of the pipe wall material. The size of the blowout varies depending on the pipe material, but it's generally greater than about 15 and a half square inches in size. The second type is a longitudinal split, which seems to occur more often on PVC than either cast or ductile iron pipe. But when a longitudinal split does occur on either cast or ductile iron, it's often caused by corrosion pinholes along the length of the pipe coupled with a water hammer event. Either way, these can be challenging for an automated leak detection system to find since the crack in the pipe quickly dampens the vibrations traveling through the pipe. The third type is a circumferential break, like the one that our team discovered at that military base in Canada. A circumferential break is typically a single crack that extends either partway or all the way around a pipe. Most circumferential breaks seem to be caused by either ground movement, and you think about freeze-thaw cycles, at least where I am in New York, <laughs> or loads which are applied to the pipe in areas with non-uniform support due to variable compaction of the bed zone, low spots in the bed zone, or variable foundation strength that allows the pipe to bend and ultimately to break. Once again, this crack in the pipe does not allow for transmission of vibration frequencies, and it can be difficult to detect. Hopefully you noticed uh, that I used the word challenging and not impossible when I described the ability of automated leak detection systems to find blowouts, longitudinal splits, or circumferential breaks. Although these systems do have their limitations, there are many, many other variables that play a role in any given situation. This photo that you see here is from uh, Johnson Controls customer in upstate New York, and they had an automated leak detection which did manage to identify a leak on a pipe that had both a longitudinal split and a blowout. So um, don't, don't ever give up hope, I guess is the message. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about vibrations and frequencies. So, um, you know, here's kind of a visual representation for leak noise frequencies on metallic pipe. Contrary to what uh, common sense or, you know, really what, what you may think, uh, bigger leaks actually make less noise and their frequencies typically fall between 280 hertz and 450 hertz on metallic pipe. Medium-sized leaks make a little more noise, and they are typically between 450 and 900 hertz on metallic pipe. However, it is these smallest leaks, which actually make the most noise at the highest frequencies, just like a steam whistle. Small leaks on metallic pipe typically range from 900 hertz to 1500 hertz. We spoke about pipe material briefly a moment ago, and by contrast to the frequencies for metallic pipe that we just discussed and that you see here, <clears throat> Leak noises in PVC pipes typically range from about 70 hertz to 850 hertz. So when you consider that a power hum can cover uh, a nice chunk of that range between 55 and 260 hertz, it lends a little better perspective on why leaks may be more difficult to detect on non-metallic pipes. So I know uh, for some of us, uh, it is getting, we're, we're inching closer and closer to lunchtime. And I promise we're not trying to be mean with this photo here, but, uh, uh, just as there are many amazing flavors of ice cream that are available today, we are fortunate to have many different types of automated leak detection systems from which to choose. Today's focus has been and will continue to be focused solely upon isolation valve stem mounted systems and service line mounted systems, which Audrey will talk about in a minute. Be sure to join us next month when we cover some of the other available technologies, such as smart fire hydrants, ultrasonic meters with integrated leak, detect techno leak detection technology, satellite leak detection, and of course, traditional acoustic leak noise surveys, as we mentioned a few times already today. So Audrey, would you uh, tell us more about leak noise loggers that are mounted on isolation valves? 
Absolutely, Jonathan. Well, with a valve mounted system, the leak noise logger has a very powerful magnet at its base. The leak noise logger is typically mounted uh, magnetically coupled to a valve stem operating nut on an isolation valve, although most any accessible point in the distribution system may work. We at Johnson Controls have worked with the providers of these systems to develop some rather innovative ways to mount these types of leak noise loggers in areas with long runs of pipe between isolation valves. Please contact us at bluewater at jci.com if you'd like more information. Valve mounted leak detection systems may either be permanently installed or may be deployed in a lift and shift approach where the utility purchases a smaller quantity of loggers and deploys them across a pressure zone or maybe a meter reading route for three or four weeks. Once the leaks have been identified, the leak noise loggers are lifted from that zone and shifted to another zone. You may also choose to use a hybrid strategy and permanently install loggers on sections of pipe that are known to have leaks or on pipes that are critical, such as serving hospitals, airports, or other critical infrastructure and then use a zoned approach to survey the rest of the distribution system over some period of time. Like, like anything designed and built by man, there are trade-offs. Valve mounted leak noise loggers have the following advantages. The sensor is mounted closer to the source of most leakage and breakage. In theory, the vibration should have less distance to travel before reaching the leak noise logger but that's not necessarily the case due to spacing between isolation valves and the distribution systems. Because the sensors are located in the street, they're potentially less susceptible to tampering than leak noise loggers that are mounted on service lines and fire hydrants. And lastly, experience has proven that valve mounted sensors generally work very well with metallic lines. Some of the challenges with isolation valve mounted sensors include gaps in sensor coverage due to softer pipe repair clamps, transitions from one pipe material to another, and splices. There's also the issue of the distance that the vibrations must travel before they reach the logger. As we said earlier, vibration waves on non-metallic pipe may not travel more than 500 feet, but isolation valve spacing is often between 1,200 and 1,500 feet. So there may be gaps in coverage that will require additional measures to be taken in those areas. And lastly, there's the concern with traffic control and worker safety, since the isolation valves are usually located in the roadway. Some AMI systems have incorporated leak noise loggers into their respective networks. Eclair has partnered with Guterman to incorporate the Zone Scan 2 correlating leak noise logger in their star network. Neptune has incorporated the SEBA KMT leak spy and the SEBA KMT pressure spy into the Neptune R900 gateway AMI system. And Census has incorporated the FCS Permalog Plus AMR leak noise logger into the FlexNet AMI system. Each of these three networks have mapping software included with the leak noise loggers that enable you to identify which leak noise loggers are reporting the leaks. The software analyzes the frequency, magnitude, and consistency of the leak noise over time, so you can better understand the type of leak. The software also prioritizes which leak sites you should investigate in order of their importance. In addition to the AMI system providers, most of the valve, valve mounted leak noise logger providers have created their own private networks to collect the data from the leak noise loggers. The Suarin CPREM 155 uses a mobile collector and the other systems that you see on the slide either use a 3G, 4G, cellular radio or a LTEM cellular radio to collect the data each morning and then transmit that data to the cloud for analysis. If you use a valve mounted automated leak detection system, you most likely will need to replace your existing cast iron valve box covers with one that will allow for the radio frequency from the leak noise logger to be transmitted through the valve box cover to that mobile AMI collector, AMI system network, or through the cellular network. Cast iron will cause the radio transmission to be reflected downward back into the valve box, whereas a polymer cover will allow the radio waves to easily pass right through. ITRON offers a different type of leak noise logger. It's clamped to the service line immediately upstream of the water meter. Adapters are available for one and a half inch and two inch pipes, which allows the ITRON leak sensor to be installed not just in residential areas, but in light commercial zones as well. The ITRON leak sensor is connected to the ITRON 100W plus ERT or 500W ERT endpoint, and this endpoint transmits the leak noise vibration data 
through the ITRON Choice Connect, OpenWay Riva, or Gen5 network for analysis. The ITRON leak sensor has certain advantages when compared to valve mounted leak noise loggers. For one, they're less labor intensive and have lower life cycle costs because there's no labor for lift and shift or valve box maintenance. And there's no reconditioning of leak sensor every five or eight years because the leak sensor has a 20 year battery. The ITRON leak sensors work very well with metallic and non-metallic lines. The reason it works well on non-metallic lines is because the number of leak sensors can be increased in areas with non-metallic pipe. For example, instead of having a leak sensor for every third or fourth residence, there may be a need to be one leak sensor for every other residence. And lastly, this type of leak noise logger provides increased worker and public safety because it's located near the meter setting and not out in the street. Like the valve mounted leak noise loggers, the iTron MLog Online software both analyzes and prioritizes the leak sites. The leak history and noise history are stored on a map of the system to facilitate asset management and capital improvements project planning. There's some disadvantages with the iTron leak sensor, however. For one, the leak sensor is mounted further away from the source of most leakage and breakage, but experience has demonstrated this is not a concern for the technology works very well. Most importantly, there's a higher first cost with a valve mounted leak detection system, especially in systems with mostly non-metallic pipe because there's more sensors to buy and install. And lastly, there is an annual subscription fee based on the number of leak sensors installed. Regardless of whether you choose a valve mounted or service line mounted automated leak detection system, your utility will need two other tools. You'll also need someone who can be dedicated to using those two tools on a regular basis and who can be trained to use those tools to correctly. One tool is a correlator. When a leak noise logger indicates it hears a leak, you'll need to pinpoint the leak site so you can excavate the pipe and make the repair. A correlator consists of two or more special leak noise loggers that are placed upstream and downstream from the leak noise logger on a valve, a fire hydrant, or a meter service, and on any nearby takeoffs. A correlator will measure the distance of the leak site from each of the special leak noise loggers. We recommend that once the correlation is complete, the indicated leak site is clearly marked and it's now time to use the next important tool, a ground microphone. A ground microphone filters out other noises and amplifies the leak noise. It also indicates your proximity to the source of the leak noise. We recommend that the technician walk the pipe in the vicinity where the correlator identified the leak site. If both the correlator and the ground microphone agree about the location of the leak site, it's probably safe to excavate the spot. If the two locations are not close together, however, it's probably worth repeating the process until the analysis from both devices agree on the location of the leak site. We understand that some people prefer a ground microphone to a correlator, and we respect that, but we simply prefer to <laughs> listen twice and dig once. It's so very important that the person assigned to use the correlator and the ground microphone has good hearing and that they be properly trained in how to use the equipment. If you truly want to be successful in finding leaks in your distribution system, your leak technician needs to be dedicated to being thoroughly trained in using the correlator and the ground microphone. And your leak technician needs to regularly apply that training so those skills don't atrophy. We've shared some amazing technology with you that can be used to conserve treated water, save the energy needed to both treat water and pump water, and save you the cost of chemicals used to treat water. We know how tight budgets are in this time of inflation and in the aftermath of the pandemic, but fear not. We can also provide you with a budget neutral funding source to pay for these improvements over time. If you'd like to know more, please either use the book a meeting module on the console or use the contact us button on the console and send us an email at bluewater at jci.com. And that about wraps up our team discussion on automatic leak detection systems for this month. Please join us next month when we'll be talking about acoustic leak noise surveys, smart hydrants, smart meters, satellite leak detection, and other methods to achieve your real water loss reduction. Now we'd like to hear from you please use the Q&A module on your console to ask us any questions you might have.
not a lot of questions out there today. Yep. Yeah, no Q&A. <laughs> Craig, we'll throw it to you, really. All Absolutely. right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey. And I, I just uh, uh, remember, if you think of something later that you'd like to ask us or, or we didn't make something clear, uh, feel free to reach out to us at uh, bluewater at jci.com. And now I would like to welcome our friends from the ITRON Water Operations Management Team to the webinar. And please let me introduce Sheila Key, who is a Senior Product Manager from Toronto, Canada. And we have two industry sales executives with us today, Mark Champagne, who is from Crystal River, Florida, and Mark Pisek from Maine. And Phil Cole is a project product manager for Outcomes, and he lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Our friends from ITRON will be focusing on ITRON's real water loss solutions in our webinar today, and, and we hope we have our other friends from ITRON to talk about their networks in a future webinar. And uh, uh, before I start, if you remember that picture of the uh, split main and with the blowout on it from our customer in New York, that was actually found uh, with an, uh, the ITRON uh, leak sensor uh, that uh, Mark's going to talk about. So, uh, uh, Mark, if you will, please tell us more about the ITRON water loss solutions. Thank you. And yeah, I'd like to thank uh, JCI for having ITRON on today, first and foremost, and, and also for, for having these webinars. Um, it's great for my colleagues across the nation and, and everybody to be reminded about all the great solutions um, and, and topics uh, we learn each and every month with you. So thank you very much. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, ITRON water operations management. Specifically, we're going to talk about the ITRON acoustic leak sensor, which is a permanent uh, leak sensor that gets installed in the field. Uh, we're also going to talk about water operations management, um, and Sheila Key is going to review some slides on, on our water operations management practice, consulting, dashboards, and managed service solutions that we offer to the market. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about ITRON to, to make sure everybody on the phone call um, knows uh, who we are and what we do across the globe. Uh, we are a large global com company with over $2 billion in revenue uh, each year. We've installed uh, and produced over 200 million communication endpoints throughout the water, gas, and electric industry. We're also a leader in the uh, smart lighting industry with over 3 million smart lighting nodes uh, out in the world today. We have over 79 million endpoints under management where we're watching that data come in each and every day and assuring that the networks and data is flowing to our customers uh, and a very large ecosystem of partners to 250 different ecosystem partners throughout the, the globe and 8,000 customers. So how do, we, how do we service our customers and what is our vision and our purpose and our value? I'm not going to go through this whole slide. I'm going to focus right in on the middle portion where you see the hands in the globe. Uh, each and every day, uh, the experts within the water department here at ITRON um, really are striving to create a more resourceful world and try to come up with solutions and innovative managed services to help our customers uh, save that precious resource of water and make sure they're, they're being resourceful uh, with it. We know um, from doing work around the globe that some folks uh, around the globe don't even have access to 24 hour water. They have intermittent water. We know that in certain parts of the, the North American market, people are in drought condition. So each and every day, you know, a purpose of ours and a vision and our value is to, to wake up and help our customers uh, save that precious commodity. And how we go about doing that, um, in, in the water space, we're going to talk today about the water resource management offering that we have um, and the water operations softwares and managed solutions we have. But I did want to touch upon this slide to let you know that we have many other um, solutions and outcomes uh, here at ITRON. So we service the electric and smart grid industry. We service the gas, AMI, and metering and safety industry. And we also um, service throughout the world, smart communities and smart cities um, industry. And we do that by offering a multi-transport networking technologies. We have mesh um, networks out there. We have point-to-point -point RF networks out there. We also have um, cellular network um, capabilities out there, NB, IOT, 
networks and LTEM networks, and uh, we, most of those in the, the newer versions are 5G ready. So that data goes up uh, through those networks into data management and, and hosting uh, platforms, and then is pushed to softwares that we're going to talk about today, water operation type softwares. But as you can see across the top of the, the slide here, um, there's gas operations, there's smart city dashboards, there's EV infrastructure management uh, dashboards and, and software that we have throughout uh, the country and the world as well. So uh, very innovative um, and, and very much pushing that data and that value of that data, not only for the water industry, but across all utility industries. But today, uh, what we're going to talk about is our acoustic leak monitoring system. And um, we talked about it a little bit earlier um, and showed some slides. I'm going to get a little bit more in depth with it. It's complementary to our AMR and AMI deployments, meaning it gets deployed and installed at the same time with the meter and the radio device. Um, and it's a cost effective um, way to manage leaks within your water distribution system um, and really try to hone in on reducing your non revenue water um, that is leaking in your distribution systems and not being metered. How we accomplish that with our system, um, we talked about and we'll show additional pictures of, of our leak sensors. But at the very base of the solution architect is the leak sensor itself. It, it attaches uh, with a simple inline connector attachment to the endpoint and then gets uh, sent up through um, many different uh, forms up into the software. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, we have a mesh collection system. We have point to point collectors. We can send it up through cellular. And then there's also uh, mobile drive by collection and handheld collection that you can collect this data with. It goes up into a collection um, system platform and then shifted off to uh, MLog online. It's a software, a GUI front end uh, with maps. And we'll get a little bit more uh, detail about that in a while. Maps that identify leaks, uh, show you um, new and emerging leaks, and really puts a prioritization on uh, where to go fix the leaks in the network. So simple, uh, simple architecture uh, drawing there to, to further kind of how the, the simplicity of the solution um, displays is down in the lower left-hand corner is an optimized leak sensor, um, a new, more efficient leak sensor in the market. And uh, it shows the new and improved mounting um, configuration that, that can mount uh, directly to the pipes. In the middle of this picture, you'll see uh, a blue circle. And that's um, just indicating where, where this leak uh, sensor would be. It would be installed within the meter pit out in the front of the curb uh, of the home. And the blue sections uh, on the pipe indicate where this leak sensor is, is listening uh, for vibration and noise uh, out into the distribution system where, where the, any leak uh, and or leakage isn't metered and you need to identify um, a potential leak in the system. We talked about earlier that on metal, um, you know, sound and vibration does travel uh, much better. So you can see that on a metal pipe or a metallic pipe, uh, the, the leak sensor can detect leaks up to 350 feet away. And on plastic pipe, it gets a little bit closer and is more in the 100 feet away. So just a very simple depiction on, on, on what's going on with the leak sensor and where, where it's listening. Next slide kind of shows some, some increased uh, larger size photos that, that help you uh, visualize how, how this device is mounted uh, with inside a meter pit and on the pipe and how it's connected to either our 500W or our 100W device out in the field. You can see that the, uh, the leak sensor is mounted on the, uh, the distribution side of the meter, the inlet side of the meter. Um, so it can listen to uh, the distribution line uh, towards the left-hand side here. In this picture, the, the home or the premise would be on the right-hand side. And then the radio device is mounted in, in, in the RF-friendly lid here for either a fixed network AMI uh, solution or a mobile drive-by solution. 
Down here is a very easy connect inline connector you can see in blue, um, just connecting to, to the 500W or the 100W. So some of the benefits that were talked about earlier, um, it's gonna continuously monitor your distribution system. Um, it's gonna be proactive in, in identifying leaks. It's gonna help you reduce your non-revenue water, lower operating costs by not having to go back out in the field as much. Uh, and it's going to identify and prioritize the maintenance. Uh, it'll give you reports to tell you where your largest leaks are and what to go fix first. Uh, the features of the device is, yes, it can be mounted to a 500W or 100W. Uh, it is automatic. The data is automatically collected through that endpoint and sent to the reading devices. Um, it is then sent to uh, data analyzed and, and presented within our leak management software. Uh, different leak signatures are analyzed and, and then prioritized and, and displayed in the software. The new optimized leak sensor has enhanced sensitivity and extended range. And also, um, it also has the capability to monitor temperature on that pipe and within that area. Um, and the monitoring temperature, there's a, there's a couple little um, brackets there saying future it has that capability today, and what we're doing um, right now is modifying the software to then be able to display that uh, within our software. And you can imagine um, engineers and water quality folks uh, want to have access to temperature uh, within their pipes and, and or high temperature or stagnant water for, for water quality purposes. So this is a new, new feature that we're pretty excited about and, and excited to get into the software. Um, and we already talked about the the uh, mounting method and the ease of installation with the with the enhanced um, mounting apparatus that we're using. So the whole session today has been about different uh, ways to detect leaks in the in the in the distribution system, and I'm just going to highlight a few more and, and talk a little briefly about them. Um, you can you can wait till leaks surface, right? That's, that's someone that has no budget or, or doesn't think they have a problem. They can just wait for leaks to surface and get phone calls from their customers um, and then go out and fix them. You can do leak surveys, um, you know, typically with budgets and, and, and resource constraints. You're going to do like a quarter of your system a year, and then you're going to come back to that, that part of that system, um, you know, in, in two to three years. So it might not be as effective as permanent leak detection. Um, and then we talked about different lift and shift uh, monitoring techniques of, of going in and um, certain sections of the, the distribution system one at a time, uh, moving around the system and doing a lift and shift. And then lastly, uh, we talked about correlating the leaks as well. So with any of these devices, you're going to have to have someone come in and correlate and pinpoint that leak before you you dig. So they're going to, they're going to, correlate and find that leak, and then the backhoe is going to dig and, and fix the leak. So just pointing out some different different ways of, of going about it, and, and, and no way is best, and we, we are very excited if, if a utility is doing any and all these to, to try to save the, the precious resource of water um, and combat non-revenue water. So next, the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what we believe our leak sensor is. Um, differentiators are uh, for number one it's it's a continuous monitoring solution so you're gonna you're gonna install one of these devices on probably every third home while you're doing your metering uh, change out or AMI program um, you're gonna permanently leave that within the meter vault and it's going to continuously monitor your complete system if you choose to install it throughout your complete system it's going to identify new and emerging leaks it's going, to, it's going to show you small leaks that are turning into big leaks. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to identify them within, within days um, and, and not weeks or months or years if you choose other um, techniques to do, to do the, the leak detection. Uh, it's permanently mounted and it, um, it has a 20 year life. So it matches the, the life of the 100W and the 500W. So that's another benefit. And then the last benefit is, is what we talked about multiple times already is it prioritizes leaks for you. So it'll, it'll show you your largest leaks. It'll, it'll prioritize your work orders to, 
to go out in the field and efficiently uh, get the biggest uh, non-revenue water um, situations out there. Warren Butler and Simpson County Water um, is, is definitely an innovator um, in this market space and, and has been an early adopter of our leak sensor. They're also um, an early adopter of district metering areas. So they have, they have really been proactive about non-revenue water uh, within their distribution system for years and years. Uh, they, have a, they have white papers, they has, have presentations. They are definitely a, a, a reference for us. And within the first year of them utilizing the leak sensor, they were able to um, reduce their non-revenue water by, by 15%, and, and they continue to have success with that. Pictures are worth a thousand words, I always say. So um, my last slide and, and a video um, here, uh, just show the, the GUI front end of MLog Online. Over here to the left, you can see um, a map with different colored dots. Green dots would indicate there's no problems. Red dots would indicate that there's a, 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 a really good leak there. Yellow dots would indicate there's, there's a small leak uh, emerging. And a blue dot um, and or symbol would indicate that you have fixed a leak there. So good asset management to understand if you have a problem area. It continually pushes uh, data throughout that process. Um, and then a, a depiction of leaks, a one gallon per minute leak and a 10 gallon per minute leak. And the pictures off to the side are data and graphs within the software MLog Online that can show you um, that the endpoint and the, the leak sensor were green. They went to yellow with a small leak. They went to red with a very large leak. And then they went to back to green when uh, you fix the leak. So next I'm gonna uh, move on to a slide that just shows a, a bit quick video of a leak of one of these leaks and, and listen and watch and you'll understand why uh, these sensors can pick up uh, the noise and the vibration in the solution. Yeah, and the, and the video should show in your media player. So that's the type of noise and uh, visualization you can you can hear once once you dig that up and and uh, obviously you can understand why uh, these sensitive devices could can hear that um, traveling down the pipes. So I'm going to hand it off to Sheila Key to talk about um, our water operations management consulting um, practice and solution. Thanks, Mark, and a very good day to everyone. Uh, Mark has presented to you the acoustic leak management under the ITRON network to reduce real losses. I will take the remainder of this presentation to provide you with a quick update on water operations management and how we can help aid overall non-revenue water tracking and reduction. We all know that water loss reduction is a journey and it is a journey that is different for water utilities whether utility is looking to start their water loss journey or is already midway through their water loss journey, we have solutions and services to help you along the way. The first step is really to understand the quality of the utility data, identifying inconsistency between all these data sources and then having the ability to integrate the data into a system-wide view. We can provide insights on your data system readiness, network assessment, and district metered area creation for customers who do not have DMA set up yet. By setting up DMAs, it essentially helps you to break the bigger water problem into smaller, more manageable pieces. Once your distribution system is set up with DMAs, water operations management can help provide system visibility into the health of your water distribution network through the automated generation of IWA or AWWA water balance table 
It allows utilities to have the ability to monitor key performance indicators that are related to non-revenue water. Through operational visibility, the split between real and apparent losses can be provided for each DMAs, thereby allowing utilities to identify areas where additional assessment or actions are required for non-revenue water reduction. So most of you are familiar with the water balance table and um, like so we can do the water balance table at a distribution system level or a district meter uh, area level so basically what we have here is you know we can provide operational visibility so you want to establish your key performance indicators and then have the ability to set baseline so you can monitor any performance improvements or deterioration over time and knowing the split between real and apparent losses is very important as it will help you to take actual actions on whether you're going to focus on real loss reduction or apparent loss reduction. So over here, this just shows a typical water distribution network. We talk about the, um, it has a water source intake and treatment plan to distribution lines across their service area. Older networks are typically not designed for population growth and water demands of today. So it is important for water utilities to evaluate the state of their water network. Adding instrumentation such as your water meters, inlet bulk meters to the DMAs and pressure sensors will allow that data to be collected and analyzed. So here, like you can see, like we have, this shows the entirety of the water operations management solutions you have operational visibility, so knowing the health of your system. And once you have that, you can apply water revenue assurance for apparent losses or water leak management for real losses. So in this case, water revenue assurance, we provide an ongoing assessment of the utility's current meter population. It looks at the consumption um, patterns and provide a meter replacement recommendation list for the customer and it also does a net present value and return on investment to help identify um, what are the meters that should be replaced so you have the optimal numbers of meters to replace that will generate the best return on investment and for water leak management mark has gone through the leak uh, using acoustic leak localization we also have another method where we use pressure sensor data and updated hydraulic models for doing that ITRON also provides a wide range of consulting services such as hydraulic modeling, DMA designs and planning, one-time meter replacement prioritization, billing data analysis, and water audit. So in conclusion, our water operations management offering offers alignment to utilities, KPIs, and goals at different stages of your water loss journey. And we are focused on the deliver delivery of measurable results to the utility. With this, I'll pass it on to Craig. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sheila and, and, and Mark and all of our friends at ITRON. We really appreciate you joining us on the webinar today. We encourage everybody to uh, attend our next webinar, which will be Wednesday, June 22nd, where we'll be talking about distribution system leak detection, including acoustic leak noise surveys, smart fire hydrants, smart meters, and even satellite leak detection. And we'll have our friends from the ME Simpson Company uh, talk to us about the variety of services that they provide to uh, water utilities. I'd like to say a special thank you to Andy Crocker. And from ITRON, I'd like to thank Sheila Key, Mark Champagne, Mark Pisek, and Phil Cole. If you have any questions, please contact us at bluewater at jci.com. We'd be delighted to take your question and help your water utility. And thank you again for attending the Blue Water webinar from all of us on the water infrastructure technology team. Please be safe, and we hope to see you at our next webinar on June 22nd.